So today we have Patrick Tripp with us, and uh, we will be uh, speaking about the Solkeen Mayan calendar. Uh, before we go into that, I want to make a few uh, notes. So Patrick and I have never met in person, and uh, we met through um, through Claudia, who's been on here before. And Claudia and I met through Schoology, and on almost every live, it's almost inevitable you hear me mention Schoology. And um, that is because it's a large part of why I'm doing this. I had, I had some inspiration to do this, um, but after meeting a lot of people on Sology and seeing what a great platform that was for people with like minds and hearts to um, connect, I thought, wow, I really want to get out here and start doing this. So, um, yeah, so, you know, you meet Sology on the road of life, you meet, sorry, soul family, and then they turn you on to other soul family. And so here Patrick and I are today. So um, if you are watching the replay, you uh, obviously uh, pressed play because you have interest in the Mayan calendar. And for people who don't know anything about the Mayan calendar, that is really who this uh, video is geared towards today. So there's... Um, three Mayan calendars. One is called the Long Count and one is called the Hob, H-A-A-B, and then there's the Solkeen Mayan calendar. And today we're going to be focusing on the Solkeen Mayan calendar. But before we get to that, um, Patrick, uh, I would like if you, unless you, well, I would like for you to share how you were brought to the Mayan calendar. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that that was through your explorations of Wetico, or what some people call Wetico. And um, if you're open to talking about that, I would I would like to hear a little bit about how that led you here. Absolutely. Thank you for asking about that. Yes. Um, yeah, you're right. It, it, my research began with studying Wetico. And I, I call it Wetico because I learned about the concept through a documentary called I Am, which was released in 2011. And in that documentary, they're interviewing a guy and he talks about Wetico and he pronounced it Wetico. So that was the first way I heard it spoken. But I think actually most people call it Wetico. But I just like Wetico better. I don't know. <laughs> That's fine. Um, and for a few years, it was mostly studying the dark stuff. You know, that's that's Wetico's uh, calling card is Wetico is the Native American concept of the devil, essentially. And every culture has a, a concept of, of a devil. Any culture that has a religion anyway or a spiritual perspective has a, an awareness of a, an archetype of the devil. And so the, the Native American tribes uh, called it Wetico or Wetico. But over time, I to balance out what I was studying uh, from a perspective of things that are dark because it's heavy stuff to study, of course. And I started to realize that I needed uh, something to balance that out. And so I started to embrace astrology, Western astrology, tropical astrology. Um, and it was through studying tropical astrology that I started to study the I Ching and the Chinese Zodiac. And I just was curious about the different types of the different ways that different cultures look at astrology besides just the zodiac and that's what completely you know i won't say randomly because i don't believe things are random i think everything's happening according to a divine plan so it was just part of it was time you know at that part of the plan that i came across a video uh it's like a three-hour video by a guy named ian lungold and he actually passed in 2005 but his video he had made in 2004 and he's just it's very basic recording of him in front of a, a group of people and he's using you know not a whiteboard but just like this big construction paper and he's just drawing all this stuff and i was completely blown away by his presentation it uh, it it didn't actually talk about astrology very much he covered he really didn't cover the zolkin he introduced the zolkin in that talk but it, he was talking about the tune 
which is the long count, the majority of the conversation that he presents is about the tune and a little bit about the hub, but really just to explain the difference between the hub, the tune and the Tolkien. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, as a result of that and the information that I, I gleaned from his presentation, I was fascinated and I wanted to know more. So I started buying a bunch of different books, uh, Ken Johnson's uh, Mind Calendar Astrology and um, call, call Carl Kalaman uh, is another one that Ian Lungold and, and Carl got together and, and compared their notes. And that's actually where Lungold's talk came from is the, the result of their, their, their two research lines being put together. So, uh, and then as soon as I learned about it, I was just completely drawn in and much more than I had been with Western astrology to that point. And I still love Western astrology. I study it still to this day, but mm -hmm. there's something about the simplicity and it might not seem simple at first, you know, cause it's just an, a, an unusual system. But once I understood the basic concepts, it was so much easier for me to, to feel the energy of each day. Whereas when I look at the Western astrology live sky chart and I can feel into where the various planets are and the different angles and connections they're making. But it just seems a little more abstract and kind of out there. But the Mayan system is applicable daily and throughout my day. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of the various energies that represent today. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just, oh, this is interesting. So I can have another version of my birth chart so I can look at you know, my journey. This was like a, a way to live each day within the system of astrology that they that they offer and i mean it's just mm -hmm. it's, so a many... yeah. it's a path yeah yeah absolutely um okay let's think about a few things here so um one thing um uh, whenever i'm introducing something new to somebody because i'm a bit of a purist um so I would like the beginners who may watch this replay to know that there is something around the Mayan calendar that came out in the 80s that was called Dream Spell. And um, it wasn't realized maybe until... At least that it was a bit of a and if you, we wanted to make a parallel, and this is of no offense to anybody who studies or practices or follows Western astrology, but Patrick and I were making a parallel the other day between dream spell and tropical astrology, because sidereal astrology is what's called real sky astrology. In other words, they're following exactly what is going on in the sky, where the planets actually were in the sky when you were born not based on the gregorian calendar and where and where they have decided to place things and so um we won't go into western astrology because the mayan calendar is the subject here but there's a little parallel right so dream spell got introduced to the world and then it was like wait no 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 that's not that's not that's if you want to study the Mayan calendar, that's not the purists way. Um, so if we could just address that a little bit um, and why it's not why it uh, it isn't pure and then go into the Tolkien if we can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the, the, the name of the guy that that invented the dream spell is named uh, Jose Aguayas. And he had, he was introduced to the Mayan calendar, the, the traditional, what, what they refer to as the real count of days. And that, that's what Zolkin means is count of days. And uh, he then, through a series of his own personal experiences, interpreted that the, the Zolkin needed to be updated for the new age, that it wasn't uh, appropriate. It was an old system that was no longer in, in harmony with the energy of today, with the new age energy. Um, so he changed, he used the same system of 13 numbers and 20 sun signs, but he changed the name of some of the sun signs. 
uh, he changed the interpretation of what they meant a little bit. And the, the most important thing is that he changed, he took the, the count that was the authentic count and started a different count uh, to, so that if you look at today, that the authentic count today is seven, the translation is seven flint. Uh, on the dream spell calendar, it's a different number and a different sun sign today, according to the dream spell. So the the uh, you know the authentic count is the one that the 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 Mayan elders living in Guatemala and Central America that's the one they follow, and when they learned about this new system, they were very upset. And one of my teachers who lives down there and is a uh, is a British guy, he's not from there, but he says that they're the most peaceful people he's ever met and they're so understanding and so patient and so calm and loving. But when somebody mentions Jose Aguayas, they get upset because he's so, he's so, he's just misrepresenting their way of life essentially. Mm -hmm. And because of Aguayas's reach, I guess, uh, the dream spell is really, once people started to learn about the Mayan calendar, just as a concept, because back then there was no internet you know, we only had books essentially to learn about these things. So Aguayas kind of got a jump on the internet and started spreading the dream spell. And so most people that learn about the Mayan calendar learn about it by, by way of the dream spell. And so there's a, there's a, a huge number of people out there following the dream spell still to this day that have no idea that it's not following the actual count of days that has been going, that's been going for 6,000 years or longer consistently, never stopped. Yeah. So, um oh i had a thought when you were talking about that um yeah well okay so mission accomplished uh, well, well oh, I, I know what I, I know yeah. what i was gonna say is that it is <laughs> it's a great irony that it's called dream spell right right it's yeah. right there in the word yeah it's right it's in the name right there in the word yeah so um okay so then uh let's talk about the tolkien a little bit and or actually i shouldn't say let's because it's gonna be you but um let's talk about that and i guess okay so you spoke about your relationship with it a little bit and um you can you know go into this from any direction you want at some point i would like to give the audience a practical way to if they wanted to delve in um and find a little bit out about the calendar and um how to use it for themselves i did in the description box i copied and pasted all the links from your youtube channel yeah um including a link to your YouTube channel. So they have, you know, so, so everybody, I guess that's what I'm saying is, um, if you go to the description box, you will find all the links that Patrick recommends, but without them going to a link first, let's give them something to, to chew on. Yeah. Um, so just as, at the most fundamental level, the, the understanding that the Maya have about the way that creation manifests is through the 13 numbers. The, they, the, now, I don't know that my traditional teachers would describe it this way, but Ian Lungle described that the 13 numbers are the 13 intentions for creation. So why creation is doing what it's doing. And from one to 13, it's telling a story. And it's like a hero's journey, if you will, if you're familiar with that concept. Mm -hmm, of course. I think we talked about that the other day. Uh, but that fundamental motion of one through 13 is what drives everything else. So if you can imagine the 13 numbers as a wheel that has little pegs on it, like a gear. Yeah. Uh, and it's turning every day. It's a different day. Today's number seven. Tomorrow will be number eight. When you get to 13, the next day is number one and just keeps going. And for the Maya, the, Again, this might not be correct information, but I, what I was, what I gleaned from Lungle's talk is that the Maya think of uh, a week as being 13 days, not seven days. Mm -hmm. But what I find interesting, I don't want to divert too much, but what I think is interesting is that in Genesis, the earth was, or the, you know, the universe was created in, in seven days and six nights. Well, seven plus six is 13. 
Yeah. So it's right there. Yeah. In in Genesis, it's it's yeah. there in the zodiac with the third no, the the well. There are actually thirteen. There's constellations. thirteen. Yeah. But there's even if you leave it as twelve, the sun is the thirteenth energy, and that and that's what the number thirteen in the Mayan system represents is the ascension energy. It's the end of the story. It's it's the moment when Buddha, or rather Siddhartha, turns into Buddha, and he just turns into light and ascends. Or when Jesus ascends to heaven in that story. Again, Jesus is thirteen. He's got twelve apostles. And yet the number 13 in our culture is seen as an unlucky number. Most buildings don't have a 13th floor. Yeah. I, though- like, I like to write and talk about uh, gematria, numerology, and all of that kind of things. And, and I always help people remove that cultural thing off of the 13. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, it's it's um, it also has to do with menstrual cycles and it's a number that's deeply connected to the divine feminine. And you could go on and on about the number 13, but okay. So they split their, their weeks have 13 days. Yeah. And then then, 20, what's what about the 20? So, yeah. So that, as I mentioned, it's like a gear that's turning. Right. And then the 20 sun signs is a second gear that's being turned by the 13. So it turns and each, each time it turns the, the 20, sun sign gear turns and the the combination of 13 times 20 is 260 and so the zolkin count is a 260 day count so it starts with well there's disagreement about what the first day of the calendar is but i like to think of it as the number one combined with the first sun sign out of the 20 and so that day which is translates as well the the mayan word for it is imash but that translates as crocodile or uh, lily and it's representative of uh, the beginning of the the first kind of experience after the big bang let's say or maybe even before the big bang when all potential things are possible it represents the collective unconscious the and lily so, is also the flower that's associated with the virgin mary right on that's interesting uh, not to interrupt just to no, that's fine. include yeah. i appreciate that uh so so yeah so on the day one Imash is the beginning of, of the 260 day cycle. So 259 days later, it'll be one, one Imash again. And in between those days, each number and each sun sign have an opportunity to connect. Mm -hmm. So it's every 13 days, there's a new, a new week that begins. And every 20 days, there's a new cycle of the sun signs. So there are 20 day, periods for them as well like there are 13 day periods and for them it's almost like 20 days is a month so there's 18 of those months essentially you know um but yeah and then the the next kind of larger gear that's being driven by this fundamental motion of 13 and 20 is the calendar that you mentioned earlier the the hob or the long count and it's a 360 day calendar and so that's being driven by this smaller gear but the and then the 365 day calendar which is the hob is driven by the 360 day calendar and actually they have more than that they've got something like 27 that are known currently 27 different calendars that they were using all concurrently okay i have a question so from the little bit of reading that i've done what i understood is that there's there's the soul keen which you just described and then there's um, the the hob, which is more uh, um, of a what we could call a civil calendar. That is is um, instead of a 260 days, it's it's uh, 360 days. And then the long count is a calendar that measures even larger swaths of time. But you were you were using hob and long count. Uh, simultaneously and i thought that they were two separate things they are so the long count is called the tune okay and it's 360 days and that's the calendar that's that's used for all their prophecies it's their their the calendar of uh that's the one they use to track the 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 huge periods of time yeah the hob is 365 days and like you said its primary purpose is to track the agricultural year for the purposes of knowing when it's time to, to collect the taxes and just kind of the, the day-to-day life. The yeah. same way our Gregorian calendar is 365 days. Yeah. And interestingly, the, the Maya 
we're using a system, the hob doesn't use leap days, uh, the way the Gregorian calendar uses leap days. Their system is 365 and a quarter days, but it's somehow, I don't know the details of it, but it's more accurate than the Gregorian calendar's way of doing things. Yeah. That's why it doesn't need leap years. Leap, yeah. Leap days, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, the thing that I think is interesting, because a lot of people, a lot of researchers uh, look at cultures that have 360 day calendars and they assume it's because the, the people were primitive and weren't able to track the solar year accurately. And so they just use 360 instead of 365 and a quarter because they just, it's just, that's the vague solar year, but that's not at all what the people were doing with this 360 day calendar it had nothing. They had their own separate solar year calendar that was more accurate than the one the Westerners were using, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a funny thing that there's just this assumption that, oh, these people are just primitive people living in the jungle. They don't know how to track the year properly, which is ludicrous. It, it, yeah, it is ludicrous. So um, hello, Robert Evans and hello, Claudia Selk. Thank you for joining us today. And yes, um, yes, Robert is tuned in. He knows about Ophiuchus, the hidden sign and uh, 13, the divine mother. I love it. So, um, well, let me say this. So I, I have, um, okay. So I didn't do a full deep dive and, you know, study it for five years on end, uh, like you did, but I do visit it every, you know, now and again. Uh, and I do that with various things. I do that with like, you know, I've had my, my chart read, you know, many times I, I like to get transit readings and things like that. And I too, have um, have, pretty deeply looked into the Yijing and, you know, different things like this, the Enneagram, human design, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm about to bar embark on a new um, journey in life. And so I wanted to be reminded of certain things, right? So the other day I went and took a look at my human design, revisited it a little bit and revisited, uh, you know, read about the Jaguar a little bit, Jaguar tone 13. And, um, it was so funny because there was, it was, there's a very, in both cases, it was very short description, maybe a page long. And, and in both, on both counts for the human design and uh, in talking about the Jaguar, almost word for word uh, was absolutely relevant to this next step of my journey. In other words, hmm. I guess what it was showing me is that I am now at a point on my path where I am literally stepping into my blueprint, like wearing it, you know, like my, my skin, it's becoming my skin. So I've, I've grown into my blueprint essentially. It was so exciting I know. to read it. So it, it, it is, uh, for those of you who wonder how much validity or how spot on it is, it's pretty freaking spot on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the reasons I love studying con concurrently multiple forms of astrology, because when I started doing that, I realized that they're all telling the same story from a different perspective, from a different age, a different mm -hmm. culture. But it's all the same yeah. story. There's just one story, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, let's say that somebody doesn't know anything about the Mayan calendar and they're like, oh, I want to know what my, um, what my sign is in the, in the calendar. How, how would they do that? So one of those links is to a website called Mayan magics, magic rather, and that's spelled M A J I X. Uh, and on that website is a, like, if you go to the homepage right at the top is a link to click on what's my Mayan sun sign. And it's got a calculator that'll show you, you, know, you just put the Gregorian date in and it'll tell you what the calendar, what the Mayan calendar day is, not a combination of the two energies on that day. So if, in, you know, in your example, it's 13 Jaguar and mine, it's two Jaguar, like both carry Jaguar, but with different numbers. Yeah. Um, and then if they want to find your website, they would find it here. And I think I didn't, oh, so in the description box is, uh, link to 
Patrick's uh, YouTube channel. Hmm. Um, so let's talk about following along with the calendar. Um, so you use, do you use a website or a book to do that? What do you personally do? Yeah, I use a combination. So uh, one of my teachers does a daily blog about the day just to kind of explain his perspective on what today represents. So I usually read his blog first each day. Well, actually, the first thing I do each day is look at the the, the live sky from the sidereal astrology. Mm -hmm. I like to look at that first and just kind of meditate on it for a few minutes. And then I switch to his blog. And then I've got two books that I use. That one is called Jaguar Nights. Uh, and I got I got these on Amazon. Who is that writ written by? Who's the author? It's a couple of different authors. Javera Piedmont and no, maybe just one author. <laughs> okay. Anyway, yeah. it's called Jaguar Knights. Yeah, and it's just a, it's it's just like a reference book. So it's got a page for each or two pages for each day of the calendar, and it's got a whole lot of information that may or may not resonate with someone, you know, but I, what I like to do is there's a section that says today, and it's just a sentence usually about today. And then I like to read about the, the people that carry today as a birthday. And then I also, it's also got at the end, just notes, birthdays, anniversaries, significant dates in the past where this day happened. It's just interesting to see like, oh, on this energy, particular day. Yeah. You know? yeah. And then the other book that I read every day is called The Serpent and the Jaguar by mm -hmm. uh, Bridget. Res, I'm not probably gonna butcher her name, Razine. Yeah. Or G, yeah. But it's got a paragraph about each day. So it's not heavy reading. And it's yeah. just her personal interpretation. It's not meant to be taken as law, you know, but mm -hmm. the those two plus uh, Mark Elmney's blog, which that's another link that I, you probably put in the description box is the four pillars. That's his website. Yeah, that's in there. And actually, before, just to give some some love and credit to someone that I used to follow, but I don't follow anymore, is a, a woman named Deborah that has her own blog about the Mayan calendar. And I, I discovered her blog. I went looking. When I realized that I wanted to follow this daily, I went looking on the Internet. Like, is anybody talking about this? And I came across her blog. Uh, and I, I followed her blog for probably three years. And then I discovered Mark's blog. And I just resonate more with Mark. Uh, and the so way you that... wanted to give credit to Deborah, so if people wanted to find her blog, what's it called? Oh, shit, I probably should have thought of that before. <laughs> well, Claudia knows. I'm sure Claudia knows. Um, it's well, I mean for the audience, so I no, no, I know. In the description like, box. She could type it in. You in, can, in... you can. Um, well, I'm the only one who can edit the the oh. the box, um, the description box. But so when you get it, text it to me, and I'll okay. put it in there. Yeah. Yeah, if Claudia, if Claudia can text it to you right now, then you can put it in there. But uh, it's. Um, oh, you mean in the little ticker tape? Yeah. Yeah. But but there's a description box that will be below the the video that we make, and I could put it in there yeah. too, like permanently. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, she wants. To, if, anyways, I just can't remember right now. It's been that's a long okay. time since I've been to her website. So that's okay. So how. How has the Mayan calendar and following the Mayan calendar made a difference and or transformed your life so far? The most powerful thing that I noticed with it is it attunes me into synchronicities. And I had already become aware of the opportunity to, to pay attention to synchronicities when they occur before I discovered the calendar. Mm -hmm. But once I started following the calendar, I realized that my ability to, to detect synchronicities throughout the day was growing stronger and more consistent. And for me, synchronicities are direct evidence of spirit mm -hmm. throughout the day. And Carl Jung, one of my favorite quotes from Carl Jung is synchronicities are an ever or synchronicity is an ever present reality for those who have eyes to see it. And so I've come more and more into alignment with the realization that literally everything that's happening at all times has synchronicity interweaving through it for us to have an opportunity to, to tune into it. Yeah. And more times than not, it mostly is about bringing me back into the present moment because I, I've, I've lost the present moment and not realized it. And so I'll detect a synchronicity and it'll bring me back to the present. And it's, it's like, 
I'm, it's like spirit is saying, Hey, I'm here. Come back. You lost me. You know, like you went into your ego and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, being present is my, my primary practice. And so the more I practice it, the more I become aware of the things that I can, when we're not in the present moment, we don't, we don't have the capacity to detect synchronicity. The yeah. only place we can find it is in the present. Yeah. And so the and more I'm in the, go ahead. The more you're in the present, no, you finish. The more I'm in the present, the more I have the capacity to detect the synchronicities. And at first it was just kind of like, Hey, that's really cool. And I just wanted to share that, like, look, that was a synchronicity and, and just point it out. But really as I deepened the practice, what I, what I was able to discern was that a synchronicity is pulling me back into the present moment so that I can have an opportunity to, to, dis, to discern a message that's coming through in that moment. And that message might have something to do specifically with that moment, or it might have something to do with something I did yesterday and I didn't understand it, but now that the information is coming through so that I can have the right context to make sense of something from yesterday or something that's coming in the future, you know, but it's the ability to, what I would describe as align more with the flow uh, and recognize the the need to be humble and have my ego be humble and recognize that the flow of creation is occurring and I'm in it. And if I'm aligning with it, then that's when I experience miracles walking around every day. If I'm in the flow and not aware of it, then I might be experiencing something positive or I might be banging against the rocks because I'm just not aware of where I am in the flow. So being present and tuning into the energy of the day and doing my best to stay with that throughout the day has led my life into a place that I can't even really describe it as a normal life anymore. It's, it's so magical and it just keeps mm -hmm. getting more magical every day. Mm -hmm. So I'm, it's the reinforcement comes simply with the practice. Yeah. Yeah. You said something there that I, I think about frequently lately is that, um, you know, when you, when you are noticing the synchronicities, you know, you know, that you're, that you're in the flow. Yeah. You know, you yeah. know that you're connected to spirit and you're in the flow and you're, yeah, it's very, um, it builds trust and faith, you know, in yourself, in spirit, in the path, in life, um, yeah. those synchronicities. And also, you know, it's why, you know, spirit spirit will connect to us through things that we already pay attention to or know about, you know? So it's like, if they know you're into numbers, like they know I'm into numbers. So they spirit communicates to me frequently through letters and numbers, you know, license plates or, you know, um, numbers in general. But, um, and so it's like, yeah, whatever is your thing or what you, what you tune into, that's going to be their avenue for reaching you. So the more things that you're tuned into, and I'm not saying spread yourself thin, I'm just saying there's a lot of tools in our toolbox, right? And yeah. so it's like the more things that you know about or are tuned into or can access, the more ways they have of reaching you, you know? That's why, like, I have been kind of a, um, not a jack of all trades, but a, a Jill of all interests in my life. You know, it's like, okay, you know, study the Enneagram a little bit and study human design a little bit and the Yijing and astrology and gematria and numerology and sacred geometry. And, you know, and um, they each ping me in different ways. They light me up in different ways. And, um, you know, and I get different things from, from, um, from each of those. And then it's interesting earlier, you were saying like, you know, every, you know, whether you look at this culture or this culture or this period of history or this period of history, it's kind of like there's this same story, you know, or there's only a few themes, right? And um, and even in looking at all of these systems that I just uh, that I just stated, it's like a, a, especially with the um, with the astrology and and the the human design. Um, and the Mayan calendar, um, it's like, they're all telling me the same thing about myself in different ways. Yeah. And it's interesting to know what you pick up on at different points in your life too, you know, Yeah. because we do have very strong themes in different chapters, right? 
Yeah. And I just find it so interesting that the chapter that I have just walked into is the chapter of living my blueprint. <laughs> I'm like, wow. Yeah. I mean, it's not like you're, you're always living your blueprint, but I mean, living the poster child blueprint that, you know, is said about you in your sign right there. Like this is your mission. This is what you're here to do. This is da, 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 da. bam. Uh, yeah. It's been blowing my mind. Feels like synchronicity. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, like I was saying earlier, you're, you're in the flow, whether you want to be or not, but are you aware in the flow or are you unaware in the flow? And like what, what I hear you describing is that awareness of like, Oh, not only am I in this flow, but I have, I have an opportunity to step into a role that was written for me and it's my best self. It's the, it's the way I can shine the most by embracing those things instead of saying like, okay, yeah, that's great. But I know better what I want for my life than spirit knows. Right. I, it's funny. I was having a talk with my, one of my dear friends about that this morning, because, you know, I, I remind myself and a couple of my friends lately, like, we are not as in control as we think we are. And spirit is not, not also 100% in control. It's a co-creation, you know? And um, so the spirit's not going to lay it all out all on the table. But if, if you're shining in your area and living your blueprint and you ask for guidance and, and, uh, and assistance, you, you, you will get it, you know, for sure. Um, nothing's going to be handed to you on a silver platter, but the synchronicities will show up and the, and the help will show up and the assistance will show up if you're paying attention. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, sometimes your longings, you know, sometimes your longings can seem like diversions or mistakes, but, you know, they're just other learning opportunities. But um, sometimes, you know, when you are on a little diversion spirit will gently or not so gently guide you like no wait this is like you're getting off your your path of destiny a little bit let's guide you this way and you feel like oh why didn't that thing work out or why didn't that happen or why did why whatever you're you're, you're questioning like what's going on and and um sometimes you can figure it out sooner and sometimes it's it's in hi hindsight and go actually that thing was totally supposed to happen or no, I didn't belong in that situation at all. And I was, I was draining a lot of chi, wasting a lot of uh, time and energy or resources or whatever. And I understand why, why that didn't work or wasn't the thing or, you know. Part, I appreciate that perspective because uh, I, I have a different perspective about how reality works as a result of that Ian Lungold talk, because the main thing he talks about is the tune and how the tune can be used to literally map out the entire history of, of evolution. If, if evolution is actually a real thing, I can't say I know, but if the evolution is a real thing, then the history of, of life on this planet is on a schedule leading to conscious co-creation. But it had, we had to go through these stages of, of, growth to get there and that evidence that's presented and this is mostly carl carl Coleman's work uh that that more or less to me proves it led me to a perspective that we have basically no control that it's a divine plan and that every single thing that's happening is happening exactly the way watch out cat coming through not including yet. including the cat coming through at this moment she's she's like yes you're on it jaguar jaguar energy <laughs> so every single thing that happens is exactly the way it's supposed to happen the only thing if we have any control at all is how we choose to perceive it when it happens mm -hmm. and in that context every single thing that's happened in my life that i would say is a mistake or something I didn't want to have happen or something that wasn't positive, whatever, however I want to define it. If those things hadn't happened the, exactly the way they did, exactly at the moment they did, I wouldn't be the person I am today. I'd be a different person. Exactly. Yeah. Now, that's not saying that that person is better or worse. It's just a different person. 
And so yeah. there is no what if in the divine plan. There's just what happens. All I have to do is figure out what is spirit trying to teach me about what happened. If I don't like what happened, if my ego is resisting what happened, it's my, I'm the one with the problem, not spirit, mm -hmm. not the plan. Mm -hmm. For them, you know, I'm right there with you, like 97%. I still think that there are things like freak, freak accidents or whatever. Like, I, I know some people say, oh, there are, there are no accidents, there are no coincidences, there are no this, there are no that. Um, I think there are, are things that, like, weren't necessarily divinely scripted that can happen. I, it's certainly possible because uh, like I walking don't down the path and a boulder falls on your head and squishes you, or there's an yeah. avalanche. It's like, well, and, 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 and it, and, and it wasn't like a, you know, the Tibetans talk about, they, they will say like accidental death when it wasn't really your karma to die at that time. But, but something like there was a freak accident. I think those are, I think there's glitches within karma as well as what I'm saying. Um, and I don't know the answer to that. I can't yeah. prove one way or another. Yeah, I'm just, just saying what I think. I'm not saying you're 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 wrong. I'm just saying I I strongly side with that. And then also I leave this a little room for error. Yeah. Uh, not error, not meaning wrong. Error meaning like something can happen. Yeah. Um uh Robert Evans shared also, are you dedicated to the truth and real God source creation or to something else like money, fame? being right or something else that blocks us from realizing that true divine union um between spirit and ourselves i yeah i like that and when he says you obviously he's talking about the pejorative you yeah um yeah tough initiations that come from spirit teaching us how we are blocking the flow yeah that's another important one thank you for contributing you guys and thank you claudia for going out and finding uh deborah's name i posted that on the ticker tape earlier uh hmm you know how in uh uh with astrology like okay so here's the deal a human it is often human pattern to poo poo something that they don't understand for right sure. Like, oh, I don't believe in all that fill in the blank, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, whether it's Chinese medicine or it's Ayurveda or it's the chakras or it's the Mayan calendar or whatever, it's all based on pattern. It's all patterns, cycles and patterns. Yeah. And, um, like you said, you know, you in in the Mayan calendar, you found that. And in astrology, you see that. It's like, it's really interesting. You can get really into it. You know, it's like, okay, you're saying, okay, well, the last time, you know, Saturn squared Pluto uh, or any time Saturn, Saturn squared Pluto in, in, the, in the past 200 years and you go down the timeline and look at the events, it's like, it's, it's the same event, just in a different year. You know, yeah. like, oh, this happened and then it happened again here and then it happened again here and then it happened again here. And then, you know, it's like, yeah, it, it's un pat patterns for me. And that's what I that's what I'm often looking for. You know, I'm like trying to see th the pattern in things often. And um, and in these in these uh, um, ancient systems are they're built on patterns, you know. Yeah. That's what I loved about studying Chinese medicine is like an allopathic doctor is often, you know, trying, scratching their head, trying to figure out what disease you have. And if they mm -hmm. can't figure out what the name of it is, then they don't know what drug to give you. And they're at a loss to treat you. This is painting with a very broad brushstroke, right? I mean, yeah. um, but in Chinese medicine, we could, we don't really care about what the name of the disease is. We're, we're just looking for like, okay, is, you know, like we won't name a disease, we'll name a pattern. Like liver yang rising with spleen chi deficiency. Well, it's real easy to treat that. 
if you know what liver yang rising is and what to do about it, and you know what spleen chi deficiency is and what to do about it, you correct the pattern and the, and you will, by correcting the pattern, you are treating the root of the, of the disease. The root of the disease is, is um, in imbalance. And so then you just have to f find the pattern and you, and you can treat the imbalance. Mm -hmm. So anyways, yeah, Western medicine doesn't use that model. They 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 look to mask the symptoms, and they they're don't myopic. Use they're, but they're, it's it's a business model, you know. That like Robert yeah. was saying, you know, the goal is money. It's not healing. If if they were trying to heal us, then they wouldn't make any money from it. Yeah. Because once someone's cured, they don't come back. Yeah. 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 Um. Have, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Have you ever had a plant medicine experience? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I asked because for me it was here she comes again. Okay. <laughs> uh for me it was it was mushrooms. The first mm -hmm. time that I experienced mushrooms, I was what I perceived it as I was opened up to a little just a tiny little window of a connection with uh, an intelligence far greater than my egos. Yep. Yep. And in that awareness came uh, the perspective that I can't possibly know the mind of God. It's too huge for my human ego. I have just tiny, like yeah. zero, 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 zero point, you know, you know, just this tiny, tiny little version of, of what that is maybe is what a human is. And so when I realized that I, and I looked at creation and started to study, you know, like the flower of life behind you, yeah. uh, I realized that this system is so much more vast and complex and amazing and intricate than anything I could possibly come up with, with my small little monkey mind. And so it just, I don't know, something about that awareness caused me to, to laugh at myself for thinking that it's possible that God could make a mistake mm -hmm. or that God could like in the garden of Eden story, you know, Adam and Eve are chilling and God's just somewhere else, not paying attention and doesn't know what's happening. Like, I just don't buy it. I think God's all, and I, I don't like using the word God. I'd rather use the word spirit, but you know, either way it's, there's no separation. It's just an illusion of separation. Exactly. Spirit, spirit is always in mm -hmm. every single infused in, in, in ways that we can't possibly begin to imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that I, that, you know, that example that you used about a boulder randomly falling on someone's head, like, no, nah, I don't, I don't believe that. I think it's exactly and the idea that someone's dying before they're supposed to. No, no, I, I disagree. Mm -hmm. I think it's happening exactly when it's supposed to, and maybe they'll understand it in the next life or whatever, if there's reincarnation, I don't know, but mm -hmm. I have found a, a sense of peace that I never knew because it's allowed me to take my hands off the wheel and instead of thinking that i have any control over what could possibly happen i'm oriented towards understanding what is happening and accepting what's happening and doing my best to learn from it instead of thinking yeah but if it had been this way yeah if it had been that way it would be a different thing but it wasn't that well way, so you can what? learn even from a freak accident absolutely it's not because it's yeah. not a freak well i'm just saying i'm if i perceive so i'm not i'm not i I never said that that you were wrong, right? No, I know. And I'm also not saying that I'm wrong. So if I say yeah. freak accident, that's me looking through my lens. Sure, sure. Um, but uh, you know, I don't. I, God, I almost. I've been really wanting to get this thing lately. So there's these beautiful people in Santa Fe. They teach something called Source Point Therapy, which I studied for and practiced for about a decade. Mm -hmm. And they they're beautiful people. They're in their mid to late seventies now. And, you know, they've had a path their whole life and, um, you know, they've explored Hinduism, Buddhism, shamanism, et cetera, et cetera. And they, the source handed them this amazing, uh, healing modality called, um, source point therapy. And, um, it's all energetic basically. And, uh, they had, uh, through their, you know, Buddhist and, and, and Hindu studies in their earlier life, like, you know, thirties, forties, uh, they 
I mean, in Santa Fe, Santa Fe is a Mecca for many things spiritual. Um, but there's also, I mean, where there are humans, there is, um, there can be, you know, misunderstanding or misperception or colored filters or, you know, clogged up filters or whatever. Um, uh, teachings that aren't maybe so pure or whatever. And so the, the concept of karma came up one day in a workshop. And the next day they brought this, I don't know where they got it, but they brought this two page thing about karma. And I had, you know, for years I studied and practiced uh, Tibetan Buddhism and stuff. And so I was pretty interested in, in the concept of karma and how that all works. And just this one thing, I wish I had it to read on here, just this one thing that they uh, handed us to read totally upended my my uh, sort of like very finite view of of karma. And in there was, and I'm I'm not able to say it with, you know in a in a very eloquent sentence. Um, probably because I don't embody it yet, but there were, it explained in a very eloquent way how like, Hey guys, you can't write everything off to karma. It's, it's, you know, there is even within karma, there's wormholes and loopholes. So even though I can't explain it the way that I read it, when I received it, I was like, Oh, okay. You know? And, um, so you know, like I said, I, I, we're very similar on our views. And then I just have this one little like room for a loophole, you know? Yeah. And I'm a hundred percent open to that as well. Like I, I constantly say, this is just my perspective based on my experiences. And I don't, I don't ever presume to be right. I just know what's right for me. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, I, I and, well, and it of- is, I mean, it, it isn't helpful to, um, uh, it isn't helpful to feel like we are a victim or we're at the affect of life or that shouldn't have happened or like, you know, try to manipulate what's going on instead of just saying, what is here for me instead? Yeah. You know, how is this here to help? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's the thing. When I look at it, at the affect of life. Right. Yeah. The, you know, the cliche is hindsight is twenty twenty, And I feel like the reason that that's a thing, a saying is because when I look back at something that happened and I come from the perspective that it happened exactly the way it was supposed to. And the thing that's missing is my understanding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's that true. opens me up to the possibility of receiving that understanding. If I'm coming from the perspective of it should have been this way, it should have been that way, then I'm not open to what could mm-hmm. be explained to me. I'm yeah. blocking spirit. Yeah. My ego is saying, no, it has to be yeah. my answer, not spirit's answer. Yeah. Yeah. And these aren't mutually exclusive ideas either. Like saying that there saying that there was a freak accident or maybe there was something that happened that wasn't necessarily in the plan um, doesn't negate all of that you know yeah yeah uh I, one of the the researchers that i've followed for a number of years is david ike and he has a quote that he says life gives us our greatest gifts brilliantly disguised as our worst nightmares yeah i've heard him say that in person when todd interviewed him on Sology. yeah 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 i love that and uh one of my other favorite quotes is um by Carl Jung, and it, I, I actually want to put this on a shirt because <laughs> people who've never heard this quote before, and probably everybody here has, but I just, it really, you can see in people that are, that are open or get this quote, it like really turns something on for them. But um, it says, until you make the unconscious conscious, it shall, it will direct your life and you shall call it fate. And that's what to go. And the thing is, is I think with this 2020 thing, that's what we're doing. I think more and more it's like we're refining and refining and refining so that the wisdom does not only have to be gleaned through hindsight. We can have it in the moment. Right. Yeah. But, um, we're getting there. We're doing our, everyone here is doing our best. 
that's what the the last level of the Mayan calendar is describing when they when they call it conscious co-creation. We're consciously co-creating with spirit, not necessarily with each other. We're aligning with spirit and deciding to participate in that plan as we yeah. understand it. And the yeah. more we understand it, the more we can participate in it. That's beautiful. That's I that's funny. I you know I didn't necessarily read that term anywhere, but those words are in my thought in my thoughts a lot lately like conscious co-creation with spirit it's just it's almost like this new mantra or something it's like okay it's not just about julie and julie's life and what she wants and it's not only spirit either like i can't sit here like a lump on a log and spirit's going to do everything with me for me right it's a co-creation yeah and a conscious one at that yeah and to me that's where we have free will if we have any free will at all it's the choice to participate or not participate that's it. Everything else is running. It's like watching a movie and expecting the movie to be different just because you don't like the movie. Right. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. That's brilliant. There, that's almost like a koan or something. Like <laughs> that's that's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Yell at, yell at the screen all you want. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Matt Kahn. Mm -hmm. He he talks about like. Ego is more than happy to go along with the divine plan as long as it goes where ego wants it to go. The moment the plan shifts, ego switches 180 degrees and just like, hell no, it gets super pissed off, you know? Yeah, yeah. I just think that's funny to think yes. about, too. That's to me where the ego starts yelling at the screen, expecting things to be different. Right. Yeah. That's another concept, too. You know, I, I kind of. Everybody has their ideas about ego. Depends what culture, depends what generation, it depends how much contemplation has gone on um, inside of a person. Um, and I see how my ego has been, has created a lot of obstacles for me. Um, but I think, you know, I think when most people think of ego, they think of the inflated ego. They don't think yeah. of all of the sneaky, like, you know, for me, whether you feel like a piece of shit or you feel like, you know, you're God's gift to whatever, uh, it's two sides of the same coin. That is ego, right? Yeah. Um, fear is, I think, often ego protection. I mean, there's so many nuances. But at the end of the day, I mean, I, it, I think as long as you're human, you're going to have one. So you, you got to learn how to dance with it. It just needs to understand that it is not in the driver's seat. It's a passenger, yeah. right? Yeah. And it does serve a purpose too. Like yeah. uh, it does serve a purpose. So I hope that anyone watching, um, the, uh, there's there's no need to ego bash. It's just about refining your energy and really um, understanding what ego is and what role it's meant to play and what role it's not meant to play and actually befriending your ego. Not like, cause all of this thing is like, Oh, you have to get rid of the ego. You have to destroy the ego. You have to, and, and no, I don't no. think that's, I don't think that's right view myself. I agree with you. I, the, part of that documentary that I mentioned earlier, uh, I am the end of it. It's the, the documentary is framed around two questions. What's wrong with the world and what can we do about it? And the first, it's an hour and 15 minutes and the first 45 minutes is what's wrong with the world. And the last part is what can we do about it? And in that discussion of what can we do about it, they quote, they have an audio recording of Martin Luther King and he's quoting Jesus. And that's the part where Jesus is saying, we must learn to love even our enemies. That love, it's not, what Martin Luther King said was it's, it's not just the I'm totally butchering his quote, but you know, he's basically okay. he's like, it's not just a platitude to just say, Oh yeah, yeah. I love your enemies. Like, no, this is a fundamental necessary thing that must be accomplished if we're going to survive as a species. And I understood from that, that love is the answer, whatever the question is, love is the answer. Yes. And yes. so my website yes. is organized into four separate sections. The first section is about preparing the soil, kind of like just some stuff I want to say before we get into the meat because the next section is discovering the Wetico. That's why it's called discover the Wetico. And that's the part where it gets real dark because we have to know, we have to go into the darkness, but we have to go in there knowing we have light inside of us and we're not actually completely covered by the darkness because it's up to us to shine our own light in the darkness to illuminate the darkness. 
And so in that discovery process, we inevitably first confront whatever it is we discover that we're horrified by. And the confrontation leads to failure because that's not the answer. Fighting, killing, slaying the dragon, all those old archetypes of how to deal with the ego, those are not the answer. That's not love. And so the last section of my website is called Loving the Wetsuko. And the answer to me is finding a way to love your ego and integrate the ego with spirit instead of having it be two separate things. Amen. May I ask you a favor? Yeah. Um, are you willing to either, or one of two things, to keep going with what you're saying or to um, maybe read what's going on today in the Mayan calendar um, with just you on the screen for a couple of minutes and then I rejoin you? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So either keep talking about what you were talking about or if you want to do something else or if you like my idea about the, the glyph, whatever, it's up to you. I'm just asking if you're willing to do it. I am willing to do it. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to get me off of here for a minute, okay? Yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll just talk about today because uh I don't I can read from the book, but I just wanted to share my perspective on what today represents um and it's within the context of the 13-day period. The, the the day that's the number 1 that the sun sign that's combined with the number 1 begins the 13-day period and so it represents uh what the 13 days is, is ruled by that sun sign. And the sun sign that was the number one for the current 13 day period was translates as road. And it's the road of life, the spiritual path, the material path. It's, it's about the path we walk in each lifetime. And so the next 13 days after that day, one road are the theme of that 13 days is that story of the road of life. And so we move forward with each combination. And today we're on the seventh day. And the seventh day of the road, Tresena, is seven. And again, this is a translation of the word flint or obsidian. Uh, and it's about truth, uh, divine truth. And the number seven, Claudia knows well, because she's a seven. Uh, the number seven is, is said to be the, the, the number of, uh, well, it's, it's a couple different things, but uh, it's the number of the, it's the halfway point between one and 13. And so it's the opportunity to see where you've come from and where you're headed. It's the, the point where you can make the choices that represent the best choices that you can make. And combined with this Flint energy, the Flint energy, as I, I mentioned, it represents divine truth. Uh, the way that my teacher Mark talks about it is it's, it's the, the obsidian blade, the black blade, uh, that's this stuff right here. The obsidian blade is used by both the surgeon and the warrior in the Mayan culture. And those two things might seem at odds because one is killing and one is saving. But what he describes is that the warrior uh, that uses the obsidian blade to kill his enemy is doing so on behalf of the, the king uh, who is seen as a divine ruler. And so what they're doing by killing uh, is removing the evil from the world because they're fighting on behalf of their divine king or their divine queen. And, uh, and so it's removing the, the ill from the world to bring balance to the world. And the surgeon is doing the same thing. The surgeon isn't really healing. The surgeon is cutting out the diseased flesh so that the body can heal. And, uh, and so how that translates the truth is uh, we cut out that which is not true to allow what is true to be shown and without judgment without ego or not without ego i guess but without assuming the ego knows already before the cut is made what the truth is and it's it requires a, a an act of faith and so combining seven with flint is the best possible choice for what to cut to bring truth forward uh, one other thing i want to say about seven is that it, it also is said to represent death and endings which seems kind of strange because it's halfway through so what how is it represent how can death be halfway through what happens for the rest of the journey in the 13 numbers and it's it's more of a uh, a physical death so there's a physical death that leads to a spiritual rebirth and the the last the eight the numbers 8 through 13 represent the spiritual journey 
and the numbers one through six represent the physical journey. And then the, at the at the top of the, if you put the numbers on a pyramid, a step pyramid, you go start at the ground one, two, three, four, five, six, seven is at the top of the pyramid. And then eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, back down to the ground. So it's a spiritual, it's a material journey to the top. And then there's a death either literally or metaphorically that leads to a rebirth and a spiritual orientation. So that may or may not sound complicated, but that's my interpretation of today. That's nice. May I ask a few questions? Please. Um, so when we're talking about the warriors and the king, um, I'm assuming that's metaphorical. That's in the Mayan culture from, you know, past times when, when their, their culture was thriving, they had warriors, they did go to war, but it was on behalf of their divine ruler, the king of their, of their tribe or whatever was seen yeah. as the divine ruler. Because, you know, you see that a lot in the, um, like, okay, I don't like to diss anybody, but I'm just going to say that I see a lot of nonsense, a lot of nonsense everywhere in the world. But it, in particular, lately, I see a lot of nonsense in the new age community, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, I guess you could say like, okay, if we're talking about, well, it comes back to what you were saying about the, um, your, your la the way that you approach Wetico and like the last phase is loving the Wetico, right? And I mean, there are definitely people that are out there with the belief that like, yeah, well, if we just take everybody bad or evil off the earth, then it would be all good, you know? And if we were to do that, literally, like say, oh, I'm working for the divine king and and he said I should lop your head off because you're evil and the world would be better off without you. It's like, okay, let's not get too literal with that because that's not what we're talking about. So just for clarification, um, there was another thing. Oh, that lately, and I'm not being um corrective or confrontive i'm just telling you something that's been coming to my mind lately um when i think of like cutting out and i'm i'm trying to work with it because i want to you know i i, I want to work with the flint day but um i guess lately at this point in my life because i guess i have watched myself struggle with things and like try to cut something out or whatever and it's like oh, it doesn't work i think i have to do more like an alchemist magician transformative thing rather than actually cut the thing out you know mm -hmm. so i just wondered if you had a, a, a reframe with that that still applies to flint yeah definitely thank you for that that clarification because yeah you're absolutely right in in the way that we apply it today it's metaphor it's not meant to be like oh go out and kill your enemies you know use but make sure you use obsidian when you kill somebody no, <laughs> like, and then you're kosher right then you're fine you're covered no it, no it definitely is meant to be seen as a metaphor for uh for removing that which is causing imbalance and i appreciate what you're saying because i often tell people uh, when someone says, oh, yeah, no, I blocked that person from my phone so they can't call me. I think that's the wrong choice. When someone blocks energy, I think energy is going to come in. It's going to find a way in. And it's it's meant to be there for whatever reasons that are up for us to decide. And no one else can tell me. I have to sit with spirit and meditate and understand what's coming to me. Uh, but blocking something or cutting something off, to me, is not the answer. It's, it's, uh, it's a choice that I might need to make it that part of my journey, but the energy is going to come back around if I, if I don't deal with it and, and figure out how to align with it. And so, um, to me, it, what, what I thought about while you were describing that, that disresonance with cutting something, it, it's like, uh, I, I had to recognize that in order for me to be useful, potentially helpful to other people, I first have to be right with myself. And I have to recognize where my bad choices are and stop making those choices. That's where the cut comes. It's cutting out the choice 
that I know is leading me to a path that I don't want to be on and instead yeah. making a different choice. And yeah. when I, when I can do that for long enough and, you know, I, I describe it as a purification process mm -hmm. and then maybe I'll be in a position where I can offer something to other people. But mm -hmm. if I try to offer what I think of as my ego thinks of as help, if I want to try to help somebody or God forbid, save somebody, and I'm doing so from a place of imbalance, then what I'm giving that person is imbalance. And so the best thing that I can do is withdraw, figure out how to purify my orientation to truly love myself and to love my ego and to integrate it. Mm -hmm. Only then can I provide something that's going to be beneficial to another person. And yeah. to me, that's what, rep that's what, it, that's what the whole Flint concept represents is self work. Yeah not work on other people. I don't present myself as a healer and I definitely do not accept that title. If somebody describes that I healed them, I'll say, no, you healed yourself. I was there as a conduit. That's it. Mm -hmm. Only you can heal yourself. Spirit, yeah. not me. Yeah. We can be conduits. We can be catalysts. We can be a lot of things, but yeah, it is good to empower the person and say, no, you did that. Yeah. Yeah. If I try to present myself as someone who's doing something for them, then I'm taking away their sacred right to heal themselves. I'm taking their power away and they're giving their power away unknowingly. And I would never want someone to give their power away. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. This is cool. We might have to find some other things to talk about and have you come on again. <laughs> I'd be honored, Julie. This is super fun for me. I love yeah. talking about this stuff. Super fun for me too. Yeah. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to look into the links that I've provided in the description box, including your website, and um, discover what our next topic might be. I would I, love to invite you onto my show too, if you'd be okay. Nice. I would love to. I would love to. I love I love networking. I always say, you know, we we are human mycelium. Yeah, we are the network. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, let me say this. So we're reaching 120 and, um, oh, before we go, let's share with people the concept of day out of time. Um, uh, we're reaching 120. I feel complete if you do, unless you would like to share something about day out of time. Well, what day at a time makes me think about is the dream spell. Because oh, that's, that's associated with dream spell. The, the the pure mind calendars don't have that concept. I'm I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I think that's right because I think that's the whole one of the big issues. And actually, on my YouTube channel is a conversation I had with Mark. Um, actually, I think it was the very first conversation for my my internet show. I just started it back in January, and he's breaking down the history of the dream spell and explaining very much more clearly than I can possibly explain because he knows mm. it much. That's why I wanted him to talk about it. But mm. that the whole thing with the dream spell is this, this day out of time thing that just doesn't, it's not part of any traditional Mayan system of accounting for time that they would just skip a day. So in the dream spell, when we have a leap day, when February 29th comes every four years, they just skip that day. And, you know, if say today's seven Flint, that means tomorrow will be eight storm. If, eight storm or seven Flint was on February 28th and there's a leap day the next day, they wouldn't count that day. And then March 1st would be eight storm. Yeah. It's arbitrary. It's not, yeah. It's not really what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. not. Yeah. So yeah, I would definitely yeah. guide people to check out that, that conversation because Mark's really eloquent with, and he's super knowledgeable. Is there only one conversation with you and him on your channel? Uh, no, we've had, Two, two so far, I think. Well, what link am I looking for? Because I could, I can also add that to the description box if you tell me which link it is. It's conversations with episode one is the conversation with him about the dream spell. Uh, oh, okay. Go into my YouTube channel, go to videos, or you can just go to the playlist for conversations with, and it'll be the first one. Okay. Yeah. All right. And I'll also add it after the, like once the video is up on YouTube, I can go edit the description box and add it. And I, I just want to make a plug for him uh, because on his website is a, a tab for um, a professional birth chart reading, a Mayan astrology birth chart reading. Mm -hmm. And I would highly, highly encourage anybody that's interested to go have that reading because that was life changing for me, especially related to this concept of the divine plan. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, because what I saw, because something you described earlier uh, made me want to bring this up earlier, but in it's mm. this, it's these different, as we move through life, different energies come in and, and play more dominant roles than yeah. others. And so it's like there's handoffs between one type of energy and another. And the Mayan birth chart is oriented that way towards, uh, you know, you've got 13 Jaguar as, as your primary sign, your primary energy, but there are eight other energy combinations that represent the three. Uh, there's one for your past, which is your childhood. And then there's one for your future, which is yeah. where you're in, where you're headed into now. Uh, and then if you go, you know, you can make a fourth line for later in life. And if you get past the hundred, there's a fifth line because it's just constantly evolving and moving. Yeah. And um, what you're describing about what you felt guided to do starting this show and the various other things you've, you've come into, because we're both Jaguar, I know what your future energy is. And that's the wind sun sign. The, the animal totem for the wind sun sign is the hummingbird. Let me tell you this. <laughs> so first of all yeah so wind is already part of my thing um because we were talking about on the phone it's jaguar tone 13 and wind is a yeah that's that the center you were born in and um it also uh wind fits in somewhere else there yeah i have a strong air air element but um there's so many things about where i'm living in oregon right now and why i am totally supposed to be here. So all around the house are these garden beds with roses in them. And I won't go into all this symbology, but you know, Mary, people think of like Mary Magdalene or the Virgin Mary or Mary, Mary, Mary. We always used to name Mary, right? Well, Mary actually just means, I shouldn't say just, Mary means high priestess. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, Yeshua's mom, her name wasn't Mary but she was a high priestess. Uh Um, Yeshua's divine counterpart wasn't Mary Magdalene. She was a high high priestess Magdalene. Uh Uh Um, So anyway, those energies have been really strong for me and the roses let me know that. But guess what else is also here in spades? My birds. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like everywhere. And they're always like buzzing me and like, you know, coming up to my third eye or coming up to my nose or coming up to my eyes or spinning around my head or mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. For me too. I got a couple of hummingbird feeders to put out on my patio and my front door. And what I started noticing almost immediately is when the hummingbirds would show up synchronously related to some part of the conversation that I'm having with someone, it's just like, I, so they, they just said something amazing or I said something that was amazing. And again, I'm not the one doing it. It's just coming through me. Right. But this energy comes through and then this hummingbird shows up in that moment as like a confirmation, you know, and they, they do it all the time. It's amazing. Yeah. That's cool. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Hmm. I'll, I'll just put this on the screen for a second. Yeah. It says, make me a warrior hummingbird disarming you. Oh, arrows are turning into roses. Yeah. I love that. I have, um, and actually right now, so the, the, the man that I am, um, living with and caretaking, um, he has been a, a painter and an artist his whole life, but, and also a photographer. So, um, I have on my altar pictures of hummingbirds that he's taken big ones, you know, like blown up like this on my altar. Cause it, on my altar, I use my my bureau for an altar because on top of there is a piece of glass. So Mm -hmm. I put pictures of my ancestors and the hummingbirds on my altar and then put the glass on top. So yeah, no, hummingbirds are are the thing right now. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay, so his name, so I I have put the ticker tape up um, so people know. I suppose I could do it one more time. So everybody, if we have not made it clear um, if you want to access the resources that we've been talking about, um, you would look in the description box and you will find um, Patrick's teacher's website there that's called The Four Pillars, right? Yeah. And your teacher's name is Mark Elmy. Elmy, E L M Y. Yeah. Correct. So this is who we're talking about, and that's how you would access that information. And may I know, 
how much does he charge for an initial reading? Are you aware of what his current prices are? Yeah, $95. And it's an okay. hour and a half Zoom call. And he'll, uh, he either will record it or he'll give you access to record it. Like if you're on your phone, you can't record it. But if you're on a computer, you can record it locally. But if, if you're on your phone, then he'll just record it and they'll send you a link to download the video so that you can watch it back whenever you want. And then he also creates a, a Word document that he covers during the reading and he'll email that to you as well at the end. That's important for me because I do like to be able to review. Yeah. Um, Okay. Well, I think I'm going to treat myself to a reading from Mark Elmy for my birthday because my birthday's coming up August 14th. Nice. So, yeah. Cancer. Actually, this is really interesting. This is really interesting. So, I have a friend. I think I mentioned her to you on the phone. And she's been doing sidereal astrology since she was 19. And for a minute, she thought I was a cancer too, right? Because it, it's obvious you just go back one sign, right? So if I'm a Leo, I must be a cancer. Right. But she delved deeper into it because I was like, okay, well, have I really been donning the wrong cloak this whole time? And I was like, uh, I I went pretty deep into cancer and I was like, I just don't, I don't see it. I mean, I know we have all the signs within us, but as, as my like main thing, sun sign, I was like, I, tr I, I, I tried it on. I tried that cloak on for three years. I was like this Cinderella stepsister that's trying to fit her foot into the glass slipper and it's just too, her foot's too big and the slipper's too small. And so finally she had this other astrologer friend and they did something. I don't remember what it was. And it's still within sidereal astrology. And I'm even wondering if they were using the 13, um, the one that includes Ophiuchus. Um, but it, because of where my degrees are, because Leo, I don't have the degree memorized at the moment. Um, she was like, yeah, you are. You, you're a Leo. You're a Leo. You're a Leo. Yeah. You're, it took her three years to say it. I said, well, you know what, Mari? I said, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I've known all along. <laughs> yeah. um so I, actually i either way in either system i'm leo no you know what i forgot about our conversation and i as right at the beginning of what you just said i looked up because I, I was going off of a fucus dates not sidereal <laughs> dates because they're different yeah. and you're right even with a fucus the cutoff is august 10th for cancer yeah so yeah you are but, you know, you could argue that you're closer to the cusp of Leo and cancer. So you're maybe more influenced by cancer. And maybe that's what your friend was picking up on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I jumped on that. That was my ego. Mm -hmm. I jumped on that without, without looking. I don't have the Ophiuchus dates memorized, yeah. but because, because the sidereal dates are slightly different than the Ophiuchus dates, I just assumed incorrectly. Yeah that uh, August 14th was cancer, but you're right. So not. in sidereal, I'm a Leo with a Leo rising and a Scorpio moon. In tropical, I'm mm. a Leo with a Virgo rising and a Sagittarius moon. Right um, but okay, everybody, you probably don't want to sit here and listen to me talk about my chart, do you? So listen, don't go anywhere. We are going to end the stream. So that's going to be the end of the video. Nobody will see us. But just stay behind the stay in the in the online green room, please. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Really. Hey, Claudia and Robert, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. It's nice to have community when we do these things. And um, wh whoever you are out there on the replay, I want to thank you for being here and and supporting this work and taking an interest, and um, most of all for taking an interest in yourself. So hopefully you will make use of the uh, links in the description box and um, check it out. See what the Mayan cal calendar has to say um, that might be helpful for you. And um, it'll offer you great insight and may you benefit. All right. Ciao, ciao, everybody. Take care. Don't forget to love yourself out there. <laughs>